I'm going to uh, I'm going to read from Terror at Bottle Creek by Watt Key. By Watt Key. Um, so if you like uh, if you like disaster kind of survival stories, you're going to love this one. Uh, because they do a, a pretty great job of trying to imagine maybe like the worst possible scenario. Being caught in a hurricane would be awful, would be totally disastrous. And we know that from some of the hurricanes that have hit the United States. Um, but uh, down over in the south where they have these huge swamps, they've got really crazy animals and really dangerous things out in the swamp. So imagine being stuck in a hurricane that's dangerous enough and then being out in the swamp without any help. Um, and, and that's kind of where we end up with, uh, with this. So I'm going to read the back here and then we'll get started and we might get interrupted here by Dr. Mancini, but we'll just have to wait and see when, uh, when she arrives. So the swamp is the last place to be during a storm like this. When his dad disappears, 13-year-old Court is caught in a battle against the Gulf Coast hurricane. Court's father is a local expert on hunting and swamp lore in lower Alabama and has been teaching his son everything he knows. But when a deadly Category 3 storm makes landfall, Court must unexpectedly put all of his skills and bravery to the test. One catastrophe seems to lead to another, leaving Court and two neighborhood girls to face the storm as best they can. Amid miles of storm-thrashed wetlands filled with dangerous, desperate wild animals, it's up to court to win or lose the fight for their lives. So, uh, in the first beginning part here, they kind of give the setup about, um, you know, what kind of a situation that he's in uh, before we get to the hurricane. But um, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. So, the terror at Bottle Creek by Watt Key. Chapter 1. Dad said it was too early to be worried about the hurricane. So far, all the storms predicted to hit us that season had veered east into Florida. Besides, we'd been through plenty of them before. It was just part of life on the Alabama coast. I wasn't so sure. The storm I saw on our television was big, and it was taking a different approach than the others. And with a name like Igor, it sounded cruel and deadly. I looked out the window for a houseboat, houseboat. I'd have to think about the hurricane later. At the time, I needed to worry about Dad's two clients waiting outside in their truck. He was supposed to have been back an hour ago to take them on an alligator hunt. They'd come all the way from Mississippi, and they were getting anxious. I keyed the handheld radio and tried him again. Dad? He didn't answer, but I didn't expect him to. I knew he was just up the road at Mom's rental house, and he didn't want me to know. Ever since she'd walked out on us six months ago, he'd, be going, he'd been going over there and trying to convince her to come back. I knew she didn't want to see him. Sometimes I think he just parked in her driveway and stared at the windows. I walked out onto the deck and looked up the riverbank. The tall man named Jim got out of the driver's side and leaned against his pickup under the utility light. He twiddled a toothpick in his mouth and looked at his watch. "'Ye get him?' he asked. Uh, "'He'll be here,' I said. The man scraped the gravel with his boot and frowned. My dog Catfish trotted up the ramp and leaned against my leg. I knelt and scratched him behind the ears. There was a strong smell of fish about him. "'What you been into out there, boy?' I said to him. He wasn't much to look at. A dirty yellow mix of terrier and collie I'd found wandering the riverbank a few years before— Catfish, catfish thumped his tail against the deck and whined and trembled with excitement. We're going, I said to him. Just hold on. He thumped his tail again. I heard the short, heavyset man named Hoss get out of the truck. His, free, his feet crunched across the gravel. Maybe we ought to call it off, he said. He'll be here, I said. Well, we got... We all heard Dad's pickup coming down the hill. He stopped behind the two men from Mississippi and got out while pulling a baseball cap over his head. He hefted his jeans, which always seemed to be falling off him these days. He'd been thin and wiry his whole life, but ever since Mom left, he looked like he didn't eat anything. She'd sucked the life out of him in more ways than one. Anybody ready to get a ten-footer? He said. We been ready, Tom, Jim said. Dad approached them and shook his hands with each. They grinned reluctantly. 
dad put on his carefree act, which used to come naturally to him. Sorry about that, fellas. I'm going to get up to you. Going to get you an old no-name tonight. Big rascal I've been watching grow for 15 years. Sounds good to me, Jim said. Dad turned and crossed the ramp onto the houseboat and rolled his eyes at me like some people just didn't understand. Well, I understood. He was wasting his time and everybody else's carrying on about mom like he did. And it was embarrassing. But how does a 13-year-old tell his dad he's being a fool? They almost went back to Mississippi, I said. And be sorry, too. You got everything ready? Yes, sir. All right. Go help Go help them with their gear and let's get out. Chapter 2 Dad was the best river guide in the country. He took his clients out by himself during the school weeks, but I helped him on weekends. Now the alligator hunting season had him busier than ever. The work was tiresome, but it paid more than his usual hog hunts and fishing trips. I gave life vests to our two clients and seated them in the front of our 18-foot flatboats. Flats boat. It was an aluminum hull center console John with a 90-horsepower Yamaha two-stroke outboard. Dad said he didn't like four-strokes. Said they were too expensive and complicated to work on. If he couldn't fix the thing himself, he didn't want it. Catfish scrambled onto the boat and got into position on an old towel in the rear corner. Meanwhile, I ca cast off the stern and bow lines. Dad cranked the motor and waited until I climbed aboard. Then he put the boat in gear and idled out into the river. You fellows got everything you need up there? He asked the men. Well, good, said Haas. Our clients seemed in better spirits now they were underway. They both cracked a beer and toasted each other. I returned to the rear of the boat, got to the spot got the spotlight out of the dry box and plunged it, plugged it into the accessory port on the console. You got the emergency gas? Dad asked me. It's up front, I said. We really going all the way to Bottle Creek tonight? I reckon. Get off this river. We won't have anybody messing us up th out there. The alligator Dad called No Name lived in a slough, a slow on Bottle Creek. It was about as far into the middle of the swamp as one could get. If a person had heard of the place, it wasn't because of the fishing or hunting. Near this creek, shrouded beneath a tall canopy of cypress and water oaks, are the ruins of an ancient Indian civilization. Archaeologists refer to the place as the Bottle Creek Mound Site. There are no roads to it, no markings on maps, nothing to even signify the place except for a faint footpath of white sand. Dad continued idling out into the river, letting the engine warm up. I triggered the spotlight and waved it across the water, then triggered it off again. We wouldn't need it for a while unless we heard another boat coming. It would run dark without any navigation lights until we got deeper into the swamp. At night, it was easier that way. It wasn't legal, but we could see better, using the dark wall of trees rising on either side of the bayous to guide us. Lights or not, there was always the risk of hitting a deadhead, a submerged log, or piling. But Dad had rung the run the swamp since he was a boy and he'd memorized where all the hazards were nice night dad said to the men the water lay black and still pressed beneath the thick greenhouse smell of the heavy air it was unusually warm for late september and the frogs and insects still cheeped and pulsed through from the marsh across the river the swamp fell away for miles peace and calm and peaceful i looked up and studied the sky it was cloudless and specked with stars. What do you think about that storm out there, Tom? Haas said. We're here, ain't we? They seem to keep throwing them at us this year, don't they? As long as they keep throwing them into Florida, I don't mind, Dad said. You boys ready to run? The men shifted and steadied themselves on the bench seat as Dad accelerated the boat onto a plane. I glanced down at my shoelaces, making sure they were untied. We'd both ride standing up in order to see better. If we hit something and got thrown out, it was important to be able to kick off your shoes. A person can drown easy with shoes on. The boat leveled out, and we were soon racing across the black mirror of water with the wind whipping at our hair. I knew we might not be the only boat running dark until we got deeper into the backwater. Usually we had the swamp to ourselves that time of night, but with alligator season in, there was no telling. I trained my ears to listen for engine noise and kept my finger ready on the spotlight trigger in case I had to flash a warning signal. 
We veered off the Tensha River into a small bayou where trees rose and hung over us on either side. Dad played the steering wheel, gently brushing it right and left, each of us drifting into our thoughts behind the steady noise of the engine. There used to be nothing. I looked forward to more than going out with him, but ever since Mom left, things had changed. Now, even though Dad was right beside me, it felt like I was alone. And everything he'd taught me about the swamp seemed useless. I just didn't see the point in it anymore. You all right? He asked me. I kept my eyes on the trees and nodded. He knew what was bothering me, but he was poisoned with her. He couldn't get her out of his head, and I didn't understand it. She was sure out of my head. I never wanted to see her again if I could help it. It's been a while since we've been to the mounds, he said. Yeah, I said. We used to hunt and fish along Bottle Creek, but it had been a couple of years since we'd made the trip. The first time he'd showed me the mounds is one of my most vivid memories. He took me back there late one afternoon when I was six years old. We left the John nosed into the bush, and he hefted me onto his shoulders and ducked into the narrow trail. After a few yards, the trail widened under giant cypresses and water oaks. The swamp was suddenly dark and cool and strangely still. The only sounds were mysterious bird calls distant and shrill from the high canopy, raspy green pal palmetto plants, and large mossy vines made it feel like a lost land from the dinosaur age. He carried me for nearly half a mile before I saw the mounds rising out of the gloom. They were eerie and ivy-colored and something from another realm a long time ago. The first few hills were no, were no higher than Dad's waist. As we continued, they grew larger until we arrived at the highest, nearly 15 feet tall, rising into the canopy. He set me down, and I followed him up the steep incline until we arrived at the top. We stood there beneath an old juniper, staring into the branches of the canopy beyond. Hit that left bank, Dad said, interrupting my thoughts. I triggered the spotlight briefly on the river bank ahead just enough for him to see a dark gap in the trees. He nodded and started a slow turn toward it. After 30 minutes of weaving through a maze of creeks and slows, he eased back on the throttle. The boat sat down in the narrow creek and we continued on, idling slowly beneath the Spanish moss and cypress limbs. All right, fellows, Dad said. Let's get us a gator. Chapter 3 Dad killed the motor, and we drifted quietly on the backwater of Bottle Creek. I walked to the front of the boat, plugged in another spotlight, and gave it to Jim. Shine up ahead of us, I told him. Look for orange eyes glowing on top of the water. Jim and Hoss both turned in their seats, and Jim began waving the light across the water and under the overhanging trees. I returned to the stern and sat in the jump seat beside Catfish and scratched him on the neck. Dad sat down in the chair behind the steering console and used the other spotlight to do his own searching. You boys ever heard of Bottle Creek Indian Mounds? Dad said. The men shook their heads, still studying the dark water. You get off in the woods on your ride and you'll run up on them, like Inca ruins back there. Jim turned and put his light on the trees, but there was nothing to see except a dense tangle of palmetto and vines and Spanish moss. Way out there, Jim said. About 700 years ago, Dad continued, ancestors of the Creek and Choctaw Indians came down from middle Alabama to build a city in the swamp. There's 18 mounds out there. They say there were thousands of Indians lived on top of them for hundreds of years. Then they all just disappeared. What happened? Hall said. Dad shrugged. Oh, bring archaeologists out here sometimes from the University of South Alabama. They dig around and try to figure stuff out. Said maybe... Hernando de Soto killed him? Maybe diseases? They don't know. Never heard of it, Jim said. Eh, not many people have. It's too far in the middle of nowhere. No roads or nothing to get to it. Who owns this land? Jim said. U.S. government. There's an old metal sign back there saying it's the National Historic Landmark. Twenty years ago, I brought this fellow out there, out here to put it up. Figured that's the last time the government set foot in this place. The men kept staring at the trees, probably thinking about the mounds. I thought about the mounds enough, and I already knew plenty about alligators and just about everything else in the swamp. Instead, I wondered what my neighbor Lisa Stovall was doing, probably out with her friends somewhere. 
She was in my same class at school. We rode the bus together in the mornings along with her six-year-old sister, Frank, Francie. But Lisa had a different life and different friends. Friends with real houses and places other than a giant dark swamp to go to on weekends. It didn't bother me as much before Mom left. Now, the thought of being left out was constantly on my mind. Better get your light on the water again, Dad said to the men. Round this bend, we'll come to a slaw on the right. He ought to be there. A light breeze brushed the tops of the swamp canopy. I looked up and saw the leaves trembling and thought about the hurricane again. Thought of it hundreds of miles away. Even if it didn't hit us, if it just came anywhere close, we'd be working for days getting not only ourselves ready, but everybody else at the river landing. As the current took us around the bend, I saw the orange eyes reflecting in Dad's spotlight beam about 20 yards ahead. Catfish twitched and growled deep in his throat. I put my hand on his head. Easy, boy, I said to him. Dad switched the light off and set it on the floor. He'd seen the gator, too, but he'd give his clients a chance to discover it for themselves. Jim swung his beam over the creek, passing over the eyes once, then jerking the light back. I see something, Tom, he said. Dad stood up quietly. Keep it on there, he said. Yep, there he is, fellows. He's a big one, Paul said. I told you, Dad said. Court, get the twenty-two out of the dry box and get it loaded. Hoss, grab that deep sea fishing rod behind you and stand on the bow with it. Jim, you keep the light on him. Hoss stepped onto the bow with the fishing rod. It was spooled with a hundred-pound braided line and weighted treble hook, treble hook made for sharks. Those eyes are nearly a foot apart, Jim said. Ten inches was more accurate, each inch representing about a foot in body length. But Dad wasn't going to spoil their excitement. Cast that hook over his back, Dad said. Then reel it slow and snag him. We gonna reel him in? Jim asked. No, but we'll wear him out, then pull up to him. It was a strange way to hunt, but the hunting regulations required that the alligator be harpooned or snagged and secured against the gunnels before you could shoot it. He can't get in the boat, can he? Jim asked. He won't get in here, but don't stick your hand out after him. Our two clients didn't know much about alligator hunting, but they'd been sportsmen all their lives and knew how to cast a fishing rod. Haas arced the treble hook down the creek and made an almost perfect cast just over the gator's neck. Then he reeled slow until the line was taut. Hit it, Dad said. Haas yanked the line. The gator swirled the water and dove for the creek bottom. The fishing rod bowed and whined as the line spooled against the drag. Whoa, son, Haas yelled as he leaned into the strain. Keep the lie on that line, Ted said. We're just getting started. So, I didn't know much about alligator hunting before, but that's crazy that you have to bring the alligator in before you can before you can shoot it. I guess that means you're not just shooting everywhere in the swamp. Um, a little bit of foreshadowing there with uh, maybe the girl that he's uh, that he's thinking about. Um, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I won't take any bets on uh, if you think that she's going to be the one that's going to be stuck with him in the swamp, but I will leave that to your imagination. Um, but a, a great book. If you like those uh, disaster, natural disaster survival books, um, this one would be a great one. 